that's tough on as a kid, you know. It is. And especially it sounds like you had to grow up quickly. I and, did. And I actually That's so uh, that's so good you got that because my my father and my mom they had me and they divorced when I was very young. Okay. So my father remarried my stepmom, which to say stepmom is weird because she raised me. I'm the woman that I am because of the both of them. And when they had my two sisters, I basically had to be like the mom because they were both working. Okay. So I grew up very fast. I was already very mature at around seven years old. Wow. Yeah. So. It's incredible when we have to, you know, grow up quicker than our time. And uh, But, I mean, it prepares us for what was to come. Exactly. And, you know, into life. Because going through that hardship and the adversity that you went through and the tragedy that you did go through and overcame – and now where you are transitioning today to the successful, empowering oh. woman. I mean, if you didn't have to grow up, it makes sense because if you weren't this strong little girl that was, you know, already adulting at an mm-hmm. early young age, then you wouldn't have been able to get through that. No, you're right. You hit the nail on the head because I was like the black sheep and I did go through a lot in my life as I was growing up. And so when I got paralyzed... I was like, oh, this is nothing because I've been through a lot. You know, I was molested when I was a little girl. I was raped when I was 17 and I was in and out of bad relationships emotionally, physically. And it wasn't until I was about 24 that I owned who I was as a woman and I became extremely spiritual in a sense of just knowing who I was as a person. And I connected with that. And then, of course, a uh, year and a half later, I get in my car accident. So it prepared me. It definitely did. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I know. When I, you know, it's so interesting when we blossom into adulthood and being the women, strong women that we are. You know, I look back at my life and think about, you know, it once was this thing that was such a tragedy, but now I look back and, you know, I welcome it and thank mm-hmm. it because. You know, without those experiences and in that trauma and those those you know happenings that happen to us, we aren't able to be here today. Exactly, and Absolutely. evolving. It's all about evolving. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Because I remember even when I was fourteen and I was in an abusive relationship, mm-hmm. I remember thinking to myself that this is only going to make me stronger. And already at fourteen, I knew. In the back of my head, I was like, oh, this is going to make the book interesting. But uh, <laughs> I still haven't written that book yet. You but no, I, I know I have to. Everybody keeps telling me. But I do remember thinking that I knew that I was a strong person inside, yeah. spiritually, as just my essence and my gusto of who I was. But I didn't really get to really experience it till after I got paralyzed. Mm-hmm. And that's when the true test came. And I know who I am now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about what happened. So uh, it was one week before 9-11. I was sharing this with Lee and Dan before you came. And I was planning my wedding with two of my bridesmaids. I was engaged to my best friend at the time. I was uh, 25. And well, I turned 26 when the accident happened. But so I was in the backseat of the car. And when that little voice is talking to you, telling you to do something, you have to listen. And the crazy thing is, I don't know if you know this, but at 17, I had a premonition I was going to be in a bad car accident. Wow. So this car accident I actually was in, a year prior, I was in a bad car accident. So I didn't think that this was going to be extremely horrific. I didn't have any idea. All I knew was that there was this little voice telling me to put my seatbelt on. And people get in the back seat and they never put their seatbelts on. Yeah. Most people. I mean, if you're in the front seat or in the passenger seat, you wear your seatbelt. But every time I got back into the car, because we stopped once for gas and once for snacks, I deliberately put my seatbelt on. And so in the drive, I'm going to fast forward the story, I woke up from a nap and my girlfriends were talking and the story started getting juicy. So I unfastened my seatbelt. I got into the center and I pulled myself forward so that I can get closer to them. And at that very moment, that's when my girlfriend was starting to drift off the side of the road. And she hit the, like the little bumps. She brought the car back. She overcorrected. The car started fishtailing violently. So I jumped back into my spot. I did not put my seatbelt on and I put my head down to pray and I, I was bracing myself because, you know, you think you're superwoman, like you're going to hold yourself yeah. still. And it happened so fast. Everything I'm telling you within a second, it just happened. So when the car spun around, it hit the back of the mountain. That's what pushed me forward. The top of my head hit the back of the seat and it compressed and it shattered my C4, C5 vertebrae and severed the cord. 
And then the car proceeded to flip four or five times. And I was catapulted out of the little triangle window. And I flew like this angelic goddess that I am in the sky and flew like about 35 feet, landed on the left side of my head and basically bled to death, saw the white light, came back. When I woke up in that hospital, Tracy, I remember like opening my eyes and I looked up at the ceiling and it was like deja vu. I felt like I'd been there before. And the first thought that came to me was like, oh my gosh, I'm alive. And then I started hearing this voice talking to me again. And I got a flash of this whole entire vision. My father, who's from Tampa, Florida, I said, Daddy, you need to go to Barnes & Noble, get a journal. He sat by my bedside and he wrote word for word my vision. And I can tell you I'm living it till this day. So, yeah. So as of being depressed or anything like that, I didn't go down that road, thankfully. And at that split moment, I knew because I know myself and I know my past of how I was as a person because I'm such an overachiever and a perfectionist that I knew I could not go down that negative path. I knew I had to pick the positive path, focus on my vision, and I did that. I picked up my life, and I never looked back. So how, how was it to spin yourself into this, this state and go, I'm not going to go down that path of depression? What was the self-talk? Oh, my gosh. And what were the things that propelled you to live into that positive being? I think what it is, what I can think of is because I knew myself already in a sense of I know what I went through just growing up mm -hmm. with my childhood and then all the stuff that I'd gone through and just how I would beat myself up inside because I didn't hit those specific goals that I would want to attain for myself. And it was just always going down this vicious spiral, this downward spiral every time. I was like my worst enemy and I would go to these dark places and I'd have to pull myself back out of them and then be this light again. And so because I know that dark, that dark side, I'm scared of that person. And I know that if I went there, that nobody would be able to bring me back. And wow. I think because of the fact I had the premonition at 17 and because I woke up alive and because I had that vision, there was just this feeling that came over me that uh, it was for a reason. I knew that. This was my mission, and I'm alive for a reason, and I'm just going to go with that. I don't know if you saw the movie wow. Sixth Sense with yes. Bruce Willis. So that was me when I was a little girl. Wow. Yeah. So not that I speak to dead people, but I'm very in tuned. And when it comes to spirituality and angels and guides and things like that, that's how I live my life, yeah. how I live it today. I, I, I knew that's why we were connected. Yeah. yeah I so. That is the extreme definition of self-awareness. I mean, just to listen to you speak of that and, and be through the whole experience. Let's talk a little bit about when the doctors came in and explained to you what life was going to be like for you. So that was the thing. When that voice spoke to me, I remember clearly it saying, don't listen to what the doctors say. Mm. This is only going to be temporary. It's not permanent. Oh. And I was telling Lee and Dan here before you arrived that, you know, because they were asking, but you're a quadriplegic, but you're moving. And I said, yes. But if you look at my hands, I don't have my dexterity in my hands. Okay. If I lift up my arm, it's going to flop. I don't have triceps. So realistically, if you lay me down on the bed, I can't sit up or roll over. Okay. So I am a quadriplegic. Okay. If I lean forward, I'll fall out of this wheelchair. Okay. And you have to help pick me and put me back in the chair. I got you. Okay? So, but, <laughs> so you. when the doctors came to me, I remember they were poking at me with these needles and swabbing me with, with Q-tips. I didn't feel anything. Nothing from the neck down. And before my accident, I was a martial artist. I was a runner. I was an athlete. I was adrenaline junkie. I raced motorcycles. Like I was a freak when it came to just being active. So here it was. Now I was in this body and I was telling Dan and Lee that I was on morphine and I'm watching 9-11 happening and I'm paralyzed from the neck down. I can't feel anything. I thought I died and went to purgatory. I was like, what is going on? But when the doctor said to my ex-husband and my father, just be happy she's alive. She doesn't have to be hooked up to a vent because my lungs were strong from running. And they said, but your wife is now classified as a C4, C5 quadriplegic. And my ex is like, what the heck is that? And I remember when the doctors explained to him what it was that I'm paralyzed from the neck down. I only had three to 5% chance of ever walking again. 
he was sitting in the corner just completely devastated. And I don't blame him because we just got engaged. We bought a new house. We're going to start our whole life. And I remember looking at him and I said, you better watch. You better watch out because you need to wash off that sadness because I'm not going to spend the rest of my life like this. I'm going to move again one way or the other. And I remember I would sit there and stare at my finger, like trying to get it to move. Entertainment Tonight came in and they did a segment on me. But to fast forward that story, what happened was why I am kind of moving now today is because I left the country three years after my accident and I went to Portugal and I had a stem cell surgery. Yes. So I was, I didn't use cells from aborted fetus. I used my own cells okay. and I was the third American to have it done and the 11th patient to the doctor. Wow. Yes. So that helped a lot. Okay, so your own stem cells. My own stem and cells. A lot, you know, it's interesting because I'm fascinated. I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes no, to I love science. It. I love so it. So stem cells fascinate me. And a lot of people don't really know about stem cells. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. So how you used your own stem cells. And it was a therapy treatment, so it was an ongoing No, process. it was an actual surgery. Okay. I was under for six and a half hours. Wow. So what a lot of people don't know is when they think stem cells, because Bush was running the country at that time and they didn't allow cells in the country. Yeah. And uh, yes, I voted for Obama. I said, maybe the maybe I'll walk again, but the country might go down. Who knows? Whatever. I'm not saying Obama was a good president, but <laughs> bottom line, Bush was running the country. I left. And uh, the doctor, what they did was the easiest way I can explain it is there's a peripheral area mm -hmm. between the nasal and the brain. Mm -hmm. And there's these cells and they are combined with like Schwann cells or factory cells. I basically say, okay, they're neutral cells yep. and we have them there. Mm -hmm. And let's say you break your arm or you get a sore, your brain can tell those cells to go to the specific area yep. and heal itself. Mm -hmm. But for some apparent reason, it can't tell those cells to go into the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. So the doctors thought, why don't we go up inside, take the cells out flip the person over, open them back up, clean up all the keloided scar tissue and plant the cells and then just weave it and then close them back up. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what they did. And what did they see of progress okay. after that? So it's, not, <laughs> they, so it's not the magic bullet where you do this and the next day you're going to walk again. Yeah. But they do tell you that they don't promise anything because mm -hmm. everybody's different. The way it takes in the body, whatever, whatnot, and how you heal. So they tell you that you're not going to lose anything you already have. Mm -hmm. So I went to Detroit, Michigan to do all my pre-op okay. before I went there. So they test you. What can you feel? What can you move? All The whole nine yard. Yeah. And then they say that if you do get anything back within seven months to a year, you'll start seeing something. Okay. Now, remember, I did not feel from the neck down. And I barely moved anything. I could just move my arms. And I felt, no, I didn't even feel my legs yet at the time. I could move my legs just a little bit, just okay. by like barely. But exactly seven and a half months after the surgery, I remember being in the living room and my nurse was uh, catheterizing me. People are like, what the hell is catheterization? So I don't void on my own. Okay. So I have to catheterize every four to five hours. Mm -hmm. So you know that feeling that you get when you're on a long car ride mm. and your bladder's full yeah. and you're like, oh my God, I got to go to the bathroom. I got to go to the yeah. bathroom. So I was never feeling that. I could, I didn't feel that at all. Okay. But at that moment, I felt this pressure and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, let me push. Let me just try to push. So as my nurse was catheterizing me, I like, I was like, I was trying to push. All of a sudden she's like, oh, what did you do? And I was like, what? She goes, whoa, 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 and I stopped. And she goes, no, 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 do it again, do it again. So I went, and then I stopped, and I went. So I was, like, using my Kegel muscles. Yeah. And I was, like, going, going, going. And the urine stream was, like, going back and forth. She's yeah. like, oh, my gosh. So we started screaming. <laughs> I know this sounds crazy, but that's, like, huge. Yeah, so after that day, I started to feel the sensation of having to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I started feeling the full sensation. Mm -hmm. When you feel full after you eat, yeah. I didn't have that sensation before. Because I used to have to wear a binder and I would just keep eating and eating and eating until I would feel the binder getting tight. Mm -hmm. Then I'd be like, okay, I need to stop eating. But so after the surgery, I started to feel my breasts, the right side of my stomach, the bottom of my butt, left labia, inside the vagina, right anterior tib, bottom of the feet, and the right big toe. And I got the sensation in my hands. So there you go. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Is that too TMI? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's I'm an open book, you guys. So this is all education because, no, yes. seriously, 
This can happen to anybody. And like I said, I was an athlete and um, I'm not going to try to get emotional here, but I see people that live their life and they're these athletes. And I know that feeling, that drive, that adrenaline. And then you go from being physical to then being in a paralyzed body. You get transported into the realm of the paralyzed. And then you start wondering, because a lot of people, that's their life. That's who they are. It defines defines who they are completely. And so for me, I do remember for a year I was sitting there asking, because I was telling you, I was so intuitive and everything. My biggest thing was like, why would you make me so intuitive where I can go into a room and brush up against someone and read them and pick up vibes about them and then now paralyze me where I don't feel anything? Interesting. Do you know what I'm saying? So at the end of that year, while I was sitting in my backyard, because I would spend days every single day just meditating on that thought, it hit me. And my spirits, my guides, my angels, whatever you want to label them as, your inner voice, whatever, inside it finally hit me. The spirit just said, this is for you to sit still, to focus, because everything that you have, that energy, it's still there. So now instead of running around doing four to five things at once, you're now able to just just harness the energy from within. That makes me emotional thinking. So, you know, it's interesting. So, you know, the first thing that I thought when you said that, you know, when you were asking that question to your spirit guides and your Mm -hmm. angels and, you know, um, maybe the God of your understanding or what it may be for other people. Yeah, whatever you label it as. And, you know, the thing is, is that it's sharpening our skills in a different way. It's heightening us to a new level and a deeper level. So not only the being clairvoyant and being intuitive and things like this, you're now having heightened senses. Yes. So I can't even imagine because the thing for me is I've been active my whole life. Mm-hmm. I've been an athlete. I'm I'm hyper. I'm like always on the go. And people ask me like, how do you do it? I, I just, I don't know. This is, I'm driven by passion and life and I love going all the time. And so... What happens for me is when I'm going too hard Mm -hmm. in life, my higher power slows me down. Mm -hmm. I end up with pneumonia. Yes, I I was about to say people get sick. Getting Mm -hmm. sick, Mm -hmm. yeah, breaking um, a foot or something like to that magnitude because that's what What slows you down. Somebody somebody like Like you, yes. Like us to slow us and stop us. And you ever think of it like I always tell people because I already know when I'm going to get sick because I've. Burn the candle at both ends. I'm doing too much. And we're like, we're like preaching <laughs> we're the same language. Right? Yeah, you're yeah. like speaking and the I was same like, language. Oh, the sore throat comes, and I was like, okay, slow down. That's my indicator. Yeah. And you have to listen to your body. And yes. Even if you aren't as intuitive as yourself or other people, really listen to your body. And if, when you're almost, you know, like being like if maybe trapped mm-hmm. in this, like that's kind of how it sounded. Now you have to be live by your mind. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, to control the mind is absolute discipline. It is. It's like Professor X on a whole other level. (laughs) Telling you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You know, like a discipline, you know, it's funny because we can, being martial artists Mm -hmm. and and being an athlete and things like that, you've already fine-tuned a lot of things. And you've performed this discipline to such a level. So how can you, can you share with us how you really sharpened the mind like that? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I can't imagine myself going from that phase of my life as a martial arts and athlete, all that, and being like into this different body form. But you can, Tracy, you can. I know you can. Looking at you, I know you can. Because the dealio is this. Our spirit is one thing. Okay, and you being this unstoppable woman that you are and just going, going, going. That's how I was before. Even though your body is still, your energy is still the same. You're either going to go one way or you're going to go the other way. Mm. So the thing is, because I knew that we only have a certain amount of energy essence within us. So we have to make a choice what we're going to do with that energy. Am I going to spend all my time harping and sweating the small stuff and beating myself up? And because that's what I did before. You know, you're in the gym working out, you're running. Like I was going to the gym twice a day, six days a week. And if this is not perfect, oh, I still need to work out this. And oh my gosh. And you're looking in the mirror and you're still beating yourself up. And when I look at those photos and I look back, I was like, my body wasn't that bad. I was like maybe a seven and a half and eight. 
But now here it is. I'm paralyzed. My whole body is atrophied. I have a little quad belly. You know, I don't have, I suffer from no acetal now. Uh, but uh, the bottom line that I could share with you is that I say that unbeknownst to people in the whole entire world, they have a disability and they don't even know it. It's called fear. Because fear alone paralyzes a lot of people. Yes. You could be completely able-bodied, have full function of everything, completely healthy. But mentally, if you fear anything, anything, you're paralyzing yourself. You can't do anything. Absolutely. And for me, I studied, you know, thank God for the martial arts because of the discipline and just the awareness and the heightened sensitivity and uh, just knowing myself my spirit and my body is just from that and then also just being connected to myself but what it is is because i understand that when we come into this world there's only two fears as babies it's the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling so everything that we've learned along the journey with fear we've all put that into our brains That's right. and so for me because i don't want to waste any more time because my time is precious now and even though i spend a lot of time waiting for my nurses and people to help me. Yeah. Like you, when you get sick, that's the universe telling you, Tracy, you need to slow down and rest. Mm -hmm. For me, instead of sitting there or laying there in the bed for two hours complaining, where's my nurse right now? Oh my God, they're not here yet. Yeah. I just go in within myself or I'm on my social media or I meditate. I take that moment to do positive things mm -hmm. instead of harping about the negative and wasting that energy. Because I rather save my energy for the positive. And don't get me wrong, there are the bad days. I have a lot of bad days every day. And, you know, if there's not a lot of sleep and the patient starts running out, yeah. you're going to snap. Yeah. But, you know, you take that moment, you check in with yourself, you take a breather, and then you just go back and you just pick yourself up and move forward again. Mm. So it happens, yeah. I love it. And talking about what you said about being in fear and people being paralyzed in fear every day. I see it. it. You know, in the biggest thing, uh, public speaking, I'll give an example. Um, as a motivational speaker, you know, it was funny. I never thought I'd ever get up in front of people. I was terrified about mm -hmm. people suffering from eating disorders, addictions, um, and mental health issues, depression, anxiety, um, all these things from my childhood. And body dysmorphia was a big thing for me. Yeah. So I can relate. So, And I love to share this story with people because, you know, people will look at you and go, oh, my gosh, you know, you're perfect or you look good. or mm -hmm. and, and we're beating ourselves up in the gym and doing things. I don't do that anymore. I actually work out maybe twice a day sometimes mm -hmm. because I want to. Yeah. And I'm passionate about it. It feels good. And it fills me up. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, my drug. That's my drug. The endorphins. Choice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's funny. I like to share this with you guys because um, the fear, fear of rejection, that's the other biggest that's thing. That's one of the biggest things. Biggest things. And so I was speaking to a group of women on Saturday. I got up in the morning and I was fired up. I was excited. You know, when it was practicing discipline in all your affairs. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I needed to be at home. I wanted to go to my sensei's birthday party. I couldn't go because I knew I'd be tired and I knew I needed to be on for these women mm -hmm. because it was my purpose to serve exactly. them exactly. and share and carry my message. So I got up and I started to get dressed and I was just about to put on my jeans and my jeans are tight and I was like putting on a shirt and my shirt's tight and I went, I looked in the mirror and I went, what if I, nobody else is dressed like this? What if this is too much for, it? it's kind of a day thing and, and then I started, and then my mind yeah. started to go and then I thought, what if they reject me because I'm dressed too sexy or I'm dressed too this or I show off my muscles or this or that. And it's interesting. And I went, no, this is you and you're going to wear this. I love and it. And I looked in the mirror and I smiled and I was all sassy. And yeah. I was like, that's it. So I walked in and it was funny. So I opened the door. The women are all there. And, and you know, for a minute I got a little nervous because I'm it's adrenaline. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm passionate. And I know I'm going to change some lives mm -hmm, today. Mm -hmm. So I walk in and every other woman is wearing their um, Lululemons or whatever, yeah. or workout wear. They look comfy and they looked all look fabulous. They looked great. I was the only one that was dressed the way I was. And I went, you know what? What I've learned in life is dress for success, mm -hmm. suit up and show up for success. I was a speaker. They were not speaking. So they exactly. could be comfortable. They exactly. could be relaxed. 
And you know what? I just learned that in the face of fear, you know, stand and face it and go, you know what? No, I'm not accepting that. That's okay because this is me and I'm going to be who I am. That's true. And a lot of us, you know, are fearful of living outside the box, living a life that we deserve. (sighs) And, you know, it's like being stuck. And you are choosing not to be stuck. You are not letting this hold you back. You're a successful actress. Push Girls. Come on, let's Uh, talk about that. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so Push Girls. So, like I said to you earlier, that the vision, right? Mm -hmm. And just like what you're saying, the women empowerment, it's it's huge. It's it's a it's a big thing. It's important right now, what's going on in our world. And uh I was in this position and I spent three years, just three years on this path. And the thing with me is a lot of individuals come up to me and they open up. Mm -hmm. And I was able to witness all these different people from all walks of life just going through some catastrophic event, whether it's getting paralyzed or going through a divorce or losing a breast to breast cancer or dealing with AIDS, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I noticed with some of these women is that they would lose something inside Mm -hmm. and it crushed me and it broke my heart actually. And I thought, no, I got to do something. So I reunited with my girlfriend, Ati, who's on the show with me. I met her in the hospital and we had reunited three years after we had met. And when I saw her, I said, we need to create a group of women warriors because a lot of people think that we were a cast, but we weren't. So I met Ati again and we started Charlie's Angels and I met Mia and then uh, I was like, I need a blonde. I need a blonde, like all American girl, whatever. (laughs) You throw it out there. I believe in law of attraction manifestation. So I had a few girlfriends that were in wheelchairs that were blonde and everything, but it was all about the synergy and the feel and everything. Mm-hmm. And then so lo and behold, a couple years later, we met Tiffany. Okay. And then so we had our, our, our warriors okay. on wheels. And okay. then so fast forward the story. I was at home because a lot of people don't know this, but I did create the show and I produced it. Mm-hmm. I was at home with one of my best friends. We were cleaning out my closet. And she's like, Ange. You're doing all these things like you work for the Reed Foundation and you da 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 da. She's like, you need to have like your own reality show or something. I don't even watch TV, okay? I don't have time. (laughs) And just there's a lot of stuff on there that I just, you know, I just, I don't have time. So I'm like, what? A reality show? What? So fast forward, she goes into the closet. She's cleaning my closet out. She pulls up all these cards, these business cards, plops it on my lap. And I'm like, what is this? She's like, go through it and whatever you don't want, throw it away, whatever, whatever. I was like, okay. So I literally, I picked up this card and it said American Gladiators. Now I know Mike O'Hearn. We know Mike O'Hearn. Hi, Mike. And so uh, Mike never gave me his card. But then when I looked at it, it said David Hurwitz, executive producer of American Gladiator and Fear Factor. Now, rewind. I met this gentleman a year prior. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to fast forward the story. So he I was at a America American Gladiators uh, tryout at the Gold's Gym okay. on Venice with a yeah. friend. And I met him there. This is a whole other story. I'm not going to get into it, but I received his card. So fast forward back in the room, I'm looking at the card and I'm like, oh, never talked to him, never said hi, no message, nothing that whole year. I took the card, I put it aside and I said, I'm, I'm going to drop him a line, whatever, just say hi. Not thinking anything, nothing. Yeah. Okay. I swear to you, Tracy, the very next day, I receive a message on my Facebook from him. He writes, hi, Angela. Remember me, David Hurwitz, executive producer of American Gladiator Fear Factor. I wanted to talk to you about a possible reality show idea. I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So fast forward, we met up back and forth briefly. He introduced me to Gay Rosenthal, who is the executive producer of of our show, uh, Push Girls. And originally, the show was supposed to be about me, how yeah. I can't sit still. It was going to be called <laughs> Can't Sit Still. And so I met Gay, and she met my ex-husband, Dustin, mm-hmm. Dustin Wynn, and she loved our love story. So she wanted to focus on that. Now, a lot of people at that time didn't know, but I knew that I was going to separate from him. Okay. So I wasn't sure. But, you know, when we were in Oprah Winfrey's pitch meeting... And they came to me and said, what do you want from the show, Ange? You know, they asked Gay first and they asked Dustin. And Dustin said, oh, it's whatever Ange wants. And then when they came to me, there was a photo. I was very smart. I took photos of my girls. Mm-hmm. 
in the chair and out of the chair. And it was sitting on the table. And when it was my moment to speak, that was just like, Allah, Buddha, God, whatever you want to believe in. It was like funneling through me like, oh, but I said, you see that photo right there? And they looked at the photo and it was the four of us on the couch. I said, this show is not about me. It's about every single human being that's out there in the world that's going through something, whatever catastrophic event that they need to be reminded that they have that essence, that thing within them that they cannot forget. They cannot lose. They have to embrace it, connect with it. And that right there is going to carry them and push them to go forward in their life. And so that's why they call it push girls, not because we're pushing wheelchairs, but because we are pushing beyond limits, beyond beauty, beyond our dreams and everything. Wow. What a story. And it wasn't easy. And it wasn't easy, Tracy. That's the other thing. People don't know that. Yeah, we went to every single network. You name it, babe. Yeah. We went there. Yeah. Everybody said no. They were scared of us. They didn't even know what to do with women in wheelchairs. And you no pun intended, but you kept pushing. Exactly. Pushing through. And that's that's the thing in yes. life. Like, that's the uncomfortable part. That's where most of us stop. That's where everyone's like, okay, hey, I'm quitting. But you know what? It's okay to fail. If you want to call it a failure, whatever you want to call it, it's okay to keep pushing through. And that's what you did. And you, you don't listen to anybody. No. You continue to see that vision. Yeah. You continue to believe in it. Yeah. Everybody said no. We went to MTV, VH1, Oxygen, TLC, OWN, you name it. I mean, CMT, even country music television. Yeah. And the crazy thing is we actually were bought by a network. Okay. By, uh, what network was it? I can't even remember right now. Uh, the one with Tyra Bank shows on it. Um. CW, that's right. CW, yeah. So CW. Anyways, to make a long story short, we shot with it, everything. And uh, I know the female woman had left, the president, and a male president came in. And he was like, women in wheelchairs? Like, what are we going to do with it? They literally dropped us three days before we were going to go on air. Really? Crazy. So nothing against the gentleman there. I'm not speaking bad or anything. I'm just speaking the truth. But yeah. whatever. So, so then what? So what happened was my executive producer was just like, uh, and I said, no, gay. I go, this is meant to be MTB. I said, we are going to do this. It's supposed to happen. And there were some people in the camp that were just kind of losing hope and everything. But I said, no, we took three months off. We took a break and Gay said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to find a baby for this home. So the beautiful thing is the blessing was we had this amazing reel that CW had allowed us to shoot. Okay. We brought that reel. We thought, what network is bold enough to think outside of the box? And it was oh. Sundance. She brought it to Sundance. Gay told them, look at this, watch it, and then call me later. They watched it. They loved it. They fell in love with us. And the rest is history. So, yeah. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps this whole show. So, I yeah. that. When was that? So, this was uh, in 2012 and 2013. So, Robert Redford bought uh, 14 episodes the first season and 10. No, 10 the first. Yeah, 14 and then 10 okay. the second season. So, tell us a little bit about Push Girls. Tell us a Tell us some of the content oh, for us, my gosh. some of the people that viewers and listeners that have not seen. Okay, it. so basically, it's just putting the real back into reality. So if you guys don't know me, I'm an open book. I just tell it like it is, yeah. and most of the girls are like that. And they, again, we were not cast. Uh, you know, we start off as Charlie's Angels. Then they wanted to turn it into Hot Wheels. I was like, do not name my show Hot Wheels. <laughs> and then, uh, I'm glad. yeah, they didn't know. But then they came up with Push Girls. But the easiest way I basically say it's like sex in the city, but on wheels. Okay. I'm basically like, I guess, Carrie Bradshaw, yes. but I'm kind of really like Samantha. Okay. But so I'm the leader of the pack. And then we all, it's just, it's women, you know, the common denominator you think is the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's our spirit, who we are, our drive. And at the time I was going through my separation. So it was my life being a quadriplegic, going through this relationship. Then my girlfriend, Ati, she was getting married, trying to have a baby. And then Mia, she was falling into like instead of love. And then Tiffany was trying to figure out if she wanted to date girls or date boys. So it oh, was you just, had everything yeah, in there. we had everything in there. I, I and it's that. all real. So and we won the Critics' Choice Awards for Best Reality Series. And I don't know how many reality shows have gone to the White House. And we were on every single major talk show from Ellen to Good Morning America to Entertainment Tonight to Inside Edition 
to Marie Osmond to you name it, we're on it. Tell us about the uh, White House experience. Wow. That was that. that, So Obama actually had left the day prior because they had some emergency. They had to come here to L.A. Go figure. But we basically the girls and I, we went there and the checkerboard floors, the hallways. It's 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 spooky. It's kind of haunted. I saw a couple things and felt things. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I'm not going down that hallway unless someone goes with me. (laughs) Just saying. But no, the experience was great because we. We were there at the White House just representing, mm-hmm. and we were able to showcase our first episode, yeah. and they had a lot of folks that showed up, and we had a panel, and I was very grateful and honored, mm-hmm. and I uh, I remember sitting next to one of my girlfriends, who's a dear friend, and at the time, in the 80s, she was on a show called The Facts of Life. Her name is Jerry Jules, mm-hmm. and the big thing is that... Here it was, disability came out during that time. Yeah. And now here's a show, it's like 20 years later, mm-hmm. that is now making its mark. And so I was able to represent and be there. So it was just very huge for us. So it Amazing. felt good. Amazing. It felt really good. I'm going to get all teary-eyed now. Because uh, you know what? You know, I think back, I call you babe already. I'm all like, you're like my best <laughs> friend. Know, like, I'm I like, feel like we've known each other. Like, I, you're like asking me the question. And I can like, I can, I already know what you're going to ask me before you finish or I'm like feeling you and thinking. And so, but I, during the time of push girls, a lot of people don't know this, but I just separated from my ex. So I was going through a divorce and a month later I lost all of my nursing care. So imagine that. that Oh my gosh. So I was with, that's a whole other, that's a whole other story, but I was with Screen Actors Guild. And um, unbeknownst to me, or at the time, I had no idea. But when you become disabled, three years after, you get Medicare. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this. So I automatically had Medicare as my secondary. So make that long story short, when SAG found out that I had Medicare, they were like, oh, well, you have a secondary insurance. I was like, I didn't know. So they went back and forth, back and forth. And Screen Actors Guild said, all right, we're going to be her secondary. You be her primary. So they dropped me. They became my secondary. I lost everything. And then Medicare, I didn't have anything. I had to fight for all my care, what I have now. And it's not much. But basically, just imagine, it's one thing to be a paraplegic and being a little bit independent that you can do things on your own. But it's another to be a quadriplegic that you can't even get out of bed. So here it was. I just had my own TV show. I was just going through a divorce. You know, I was breaking up with my soulmate. And now I have no care. What am I going to do? So fortunate for me, my angel at the time was my Auntie Judy, who's also on the show. She stepped in and she spent two years, day and night, taking care of me. She, everything that you see that happened in that show was all because of her. I'm going to get emotional now because I'm really thinking back. Because I remember when we were at Sundance, we were just going, 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 going nonstop with the schedule. And she's like, oh my God. Now I know why the celebrities, because she has a Filipino accent, she's like, why they have nervous breakdown? Because <laughs> we were just going, 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 because it's like, sure. okay, go upstairs, go change in 30 minutes, we'll meet you back downstairs. How can two women get ready in 30 minutes? <laughs> exactly. But we would do it. So just, yeah, it was crazy. But I think because all that happened, I was basically like the, like in the eye of the storm. It was able to, I was able to be grounded yes. and just... Like I told the girls, I said, you know, the moment you guys go up on that pedestal and all floating in the clouds and your head gets big, I'm going to knock them pedestal down and bring you guys back down to the yes. ground. And so I think because that was all going on with me, I was able to just stay focused and just like be grounded a bit because I had to focus on that stuff. Because when I look back and I look at push girls, I could see I was holding a lot in, in a sense of just trying to control everything. And of course, we can't control everything, but um, yeah, yeah it was, it's it's a different we Angela. Like, we like to try. Yeah, yeah we, we like, like to, to try. try. Oh when yeah. I, whenever I try to control anything in life, it um, it goes completely sideways and backwards. Yeah. and comes out the other end. Hello, but, I was a control freak. Look with me now. So, what is life like right now? Life in a sense of being a quadriplegic, or just in general? Yeah, let's go with that first. And so, what kind of care do you? Oh, wow, Tracy. I'm not I'm not here to have a pity party or anything like that. But 
So my care now, I have a gentleman, a wonderful man. His name is Umo. Umo comes in in the mornings for two hours. And it's just basic, you know, he bathes me, dresses me, puts me in the wheelchair, yeah. brush teeth, wash face. I do my own makeup. Yeah. And then he leaves two hours. And then I'm by myself throughout the whole day. My honey is usually with me. If he's working, then I'm home by myself. Uh, they'll usually leave like food for me. And then I have a second nurse that comes to help me go to the bathroom. Okay. And then that's usually around three o'clock, two, three o'clock. Then I'm pretty much on my own all the way till the night. Okay. And then the nurse comes back for one hour. So I basically have four hours of nursing care. Okay. Well, and what everything. What does your day look like? What do you... Oh my gosh. Tell us so, about your day. so my day <laughs> can be anything. So I'm a night owl, first of all. Okay. So I go to sleep at like five or six in the morning. Oh, wow. The day before yesterday, I went to bed at 8 in the morning. That was not by choice. That just happened because my honey right now, he's in Italy, so I get spasms at night. So even though I lay on my back throughout the whole night, my legs will spasm and they'll shift and they'll go to the side. So when nobody's in the bed with me, my legs spasm. They go to the side and one leg goes hanging off the bed. So last night I was like one leg hanging off the bed, but I slept like that. But at least I slept, what, five and a half hours? So... My usual day is I get up and I have my brunch because by the time I eat, it's like two o'clock and I usually can roll into my office. I have an office in my house and I do all my social media to all my emails, to all my calls and everything. I basically just run my rolling empire from there. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not shooting, I could be I could be shooting on a set or I could be working or doing a speaking engagement or just out with friends, whatever. But right now, predominantly, I'm home just focusing on my projects that I'm working on right now. And then I eat, you know, I eat every three to four hours. So I'll go into the kitchen and whoever's around, they help me, whatnot. And then bathroom wise, my honey will help me when he's home. And then uh, I'm just working most of the time. So you're it's crazy. doing the acting. Yes. Yes. So let's oh talk my about gosh. some of the projects and things oh, that you're working on. That's I'm like, exciting. I'm crazy right now because... So I got into the acting before the accident, okay? okay. Just, I, I got a little of the bug in me from my ex-husband. <laughs> and I was lucky to be like a glorified extra on Fast and the Furious and VIP with Pamela Anderson. So after I got injured, I didn't know that people in wheelchairs could be actors. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. They call them PWDs, Performers with Disabilities. Okay. And so I jumped into the industry five years after I was paralyzed mm -hmm. and Tracy, you literally are sitting around waiting for wheelchair rolls to roll in. So if you're lucky, like 17 years ago, you get like one to two a year. Okay. okay? So after I was fortunate, because what happened was I couldn't sit around waiting for wheelchair rolls. And that's why I started modeling for six years. Okay. And then after the modeling, I was like, okay, I need to do something. And that's when I did Push Girls. Mm -hmm. So after I did Push Girls, I stopped acting and I stopped modeling because I was focusing on the show. Yeah. So I took about two and a half, I took three years off. I was in hibernation. So last year, I said in November on 11-11, I said, okay, that's it. 2018, I'm jumping back into modeling, back into acting, full force, unstoppable, that's it. Mm -hmm. So I said it, and like I said, 11-11, I met this amazing director. Her name is Maram Hassler, okay. and she's gorgeous inside and out like yourself. And she's actress, producer, director. She's just a renaissance woman. Mm -hmm. So she wrote the script and uh, make a long story short. I don't know. Did you see 50 shades of gray? Yes. Okay. I didn't read the book, but one day I was in my office working and I stumbled on the YouTube, the trailer, okay. but it wasn't just the trailer. Cause when I saw the trailer, I was like, mm, I don't know if I want to watch that, but I saw the interview with the director and the producer and it was very interesting. So it made me watch the movie one and two. I was like this high school girl, like screaming, like, no, like it was so funny. But after I watched it, I told my honey, I said, baby, I need to do a movie like this. I need to do something like this. I either produce it, write it. I don't know. They need to have a woman in a wheelchair that is powerful, that is sexual. And just because you don't see any of that. Yes, like that man, right. you know, just, yeah. just like him, but in a woman yeah. form in a chair. Yeah. And so <laughs> Maram came to me. So I am working on this project now called Pen Pals. And I play a bisexual sex therapist. And it's very interesting because two weekends ago, we had our love scene, me and my girlfriend in the bathtub. And uh, yeah, let's just say, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. 
Just get ready. You might get your eyes poked out. No, I'm kidding. I love but, it. But yeah, so it's a little bit of nudity, so but tasteful. I don't know how, because I was like, okay, I'm, I'm okay with nudity we, as long as we don't show too much, whatever, but yeah. just tastefully shot and everything. But it's intense because she doesn't exactly like rape me, but it's a very physical. Okay. She basically pulls me under the water. Okay. And so that was crazy doing that stunt because wow. I did it on my own. Okay. And it's one thing to think. Forget that you're paralyzed because, you know, you're, you're, you're this woman like yourself and you're thinking, OK, I can do this. I got this. And I'm telling my honey, uh, Stefano, who was helping me. We had a, a gentleman that was there on the set who was Carl, who was helping us, like explaining everything, who's okay. Maram's uh, boyfriend. But basically, I was telling my honey because I was like, OK, on the count of three, you're just going to just grab my legs and just yank me down under the water. Yeah. And they had the red cam above me, like just like shooting down. And I was like, OK. So in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, when you go under the water, you can hold your breath. Yeah. And so water doesn't go in. You can like hold your breath. So. <laughs> but it's different. Like I this. forgot I'm paralyzed and my diaphragm doesn't work. So the oh. moment Stefano pulled me under the water because they told me to like flail my arms to give like the effect of just the drama. Okay. I went under, even though my mouth was closed and I wasn't breathing, the water started going into oh. my nose. So I could, I could smell and taste the rust of the tub or whatever the concoction that was in that water it just was and I was like oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god yes it was real and I was like what are they gonna pull me up what are they so when they finally pulled me up I was like like blowing all this snot and spitting and just everything because it was disgusting but we got the shot so that's all that matters but I just thought to myself wow here it was. I forgot. I, I forget sometimes I'm yeah. paralyzed. I think I can do something because most of the time I don't see myself as paralyzed. Yeah, and know. that's the thing. So, yeah. <laughs> Did I answer your question? I went into yeah, that. Yeah. And I so, love that. I mean, it's so. Did they create that role for you? No, she wrote this. Okay. I pulled her aside and I said, Can I ask you, why is it that you wrote this woman in a wheelchair? Do you have a girlfriend in a wheelchair? Do you know? She has no. She said no. She no. just felt it. And you want to know something creepy, which I know that you'll love and appreciate. She said after I read for her and I auditioned for her that she actually had my picture on her vision board because before she even met me, before she even wrote it, she went online to look up like hot girl in wheelchair or whatever, whatever. <laughs> and it was my photo. And I believe my best friend too, she had both of the photos up. She didn't know if she was going to be able to meet me or anything. She said, she, I didn't know if I was going to be able to even reach you. And she said she wrote my part looking at my photo. It's so eerie how we're very similar. And wow. yeah, she just plugged into it and that was it. There are no mistakes no. in life and no. everything. And, you know, that's the power of the vision boards, too. And I love saying that because a lot of people think they're kind of weird or stupid. No. or um, Every time I've had a vision board. Do you have one right now? Yes, I have absolutely. one, too. I want to see yours. Oh, is yeah. That, where is that hanging? <laughs> Mine's in my bedroom. Okay, mine's in my office. <clears throat> Mine is, I, you know, it's funny. I'm a little weird with my vision board. I, not that I have a lot of people over, but I don't like people to see it. Yeah. I'm superstitious. No, I understand. Yes, so yes. So I pull it down and I hide it. And okay, like, I understand. Private little baby. Yeah, because people are like, what is that? What is that? Yeah. But vision boards, yeah. I mean, they're so incredible because you're, you have to have vision in life. We have vision and we have purpose and we have drive. And then we put into action. Exactly. So why would we not have a vision board of all the things that we want and we want to manifest and bring into our life? It's true. What do you have some of the things on your vision board? Well, big, the rolling empire. And then right in the center, it says the book. And then over here, oh. it says new show. And yeah. then motivational speaking and yes. a certain amount of money that I want to make and have in my bank account at a certain age. But I teach manifestation classes. Yes. So uh, it's very important because like you said, people... You know, you get up, yeah, I have this dream. I want to be such and such. Oh, yeah, I know I'm going to do this, do such yeah. and such. You can have it within you, but then to see it every day in front of your face, that's like even more powerful because mm -hmm. it's reminding you to just focus, focus, focus even more. Absolutely. Yeah. If you guys don't have a vision board, I highly suggest doing yes. it. I'm actually going to do a vision board class. Oh, so I would love <clears throat> it's going to be for guys and girls because I think that, you know, what we need to share stuff like this together. So I will do just the female group because I know a lot of the women want it private. Yeah. But get a vision board done and have it because it's so amazing. 
And the other thing that I love is to uh, affirmations and a sticky note. Oh my note. gosh! Sticky note, I, I like love you more. <laughs> I'm a nerd. Ah! I'm like, okay. This, I this, love this. it. I can't even see in the mirror sometimes because I have so many sticky notes, and it's like, I am enough. I am. I am powerful. I am strong. I am beautiful. I am. You know all these things, and just to remember. And it's funny because people say to me. Well, you're already so, you know, you're so motivational and you're always positive. And that's the truth. That's your first yeah, mistake. Yeah. That's not true. Exactly. <laughs> that is not true. But we have to feed ourselves full of this, you know, and so that we can live this beautiful life and, and it, breathe it into existence. It's true. And the manifestation. And I love that. So, you know, positive thinking every single day. What do you want for your life? Who are you? Why are you here? What do you want to do? But most of all, what this is the crucial part that I find that a lot of people forget is what are you going to do for other people? You are an example of that. It's completely hands down. It's just like through all of this, and this is what I've heard, and we just met today, but I feel like I've known you yes, my whole life. Yes, exactly. I feel the same. It's crazy. I'm like, am I being cheesy here? But I feel like I've known her forever. <laughs> like. Like sister souls here. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, is that what I hear in, in what I see in your eyes is you're thinking about how you can convey your message to the world mm -hmm. to help other people. Your show, producer of the show. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of us are in our egos. We want to be the star of the show. Yeah, I'm no. a Leo. I want to be the star of my own show. Yeah. No, you know, I didn't want to be the star. Like, but we get out of ourselves. And you know what? You were like... What can I do so that people can see this, use me as an example, and all these other beautiful vessels and human beings so that we can share our experience, strength, and hope to empower the world? And this is what you've done and continue to do. And not once has there been any feeling that I've gotten from you about feeling sorry for yourself ever, ever. The power of the mind Every single day, just sharpening the tools and keep telling yourself, you know what? Whatever you tell yourself, you will be. It's the truth. I believe in that. You've shown that. I believe That's in it completely. Are. This book, I want you to teach me. Well, you can help me manifest the man of my dreams. Yes. <laughs> we so have to write the list the, first. That's the one part. Oh, I've we have got to write the list. list. Okay. You have to the be so detailed. Long. Okay. Because I have a list. Oh, no. And I'm... my honey fits it. There's two things maybe off. But he fits it pretty much, yeah. Oh, I learned. Uh, you have to be very detailed. Yes, very, detailed. very specific. So when you ask for patience, don't uh, ask for patience. Just patience. Ask for what patience will look like. Exactly. Because that's how I met my ex-husband. <laughs> exactly. And so now I'm very detailed. Everything is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's people look at it and go, oh, my gosh, you'll never meet the man of your dreams. And yes, I will. Exactly. Because, you know, you have to write it in detail and, and really put down pen to paper Put that vision down on paper. And not everybody has a clear vision no. as you do. Um, so live outside the box, guys. Enjoy yes. life no matter what position yes. you are in life. Yes. So two things that you can share with the world and tell them to have a, live a great life. Okay. So one thing I always say is that I do believe that this life is a gift. Mm -hmm. And what we do with our life is our give back to the world to others and to ourselves. And that's the one thing that people forget is back to themselves. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing that you need to remember is to be grateful for the littlest things. Mm -hmm. People are so caught up in, oh, I want to get there. Oh, I want this. Or it's not happening now. And it's not in this time. And oh my gosh, I thought I would be there by now. Mm -hmm. But you need to stop, come back into yourself, come back in the moment, look around and just appreciate what you have, the littlest things, because tomorrow is not promised and you waste so much time focusing so much and beating yourself up on what's in the future mm -hmm. when you could just be in the present moment and just appreciate that. And just know when you're going through that hard time that it's not going to be permanent. It's only temporary. And patience and knowing who you are inside, that you're this unstoppable force that is strong, that you can get through anything. I love it. She's... Yes. I swear, this no. is like my sister, right? <laughs> <laughs> everything. It's funny, uh, just a quick story before we leave. Um, so on the uh, stair climber this morning, and just thinking about everything, I got lots of stuff on my mind, and I 
I just I looked outside and I went, I am so grateful for this beautiful life. I'm grateful for this earth, this sunshine, this uh, like feeling the ability to be able to do cardio, the ability to have my health, all these things. And it's like this tension, this vice grip that was on my head just released. Yeah. From living in gratitude. Exactly. Angela Rockwood, thank you so much for being thank here you. today. You are an amazing ah, so good. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> I love you. this girl. Thank Where thank do we you. find you on social media? Oh my gosh. So go to Instagram, the real Angela Rockwood. Facebook, Angela Rockwood. I have like five social medias and Instagram. Yes. I have the real Angela Rockwood, the beauty blazer, motivation with Ange, Charlie's Angels, and Push Girls Motivation. So that's where you can find me. Find her, and uh, you have to write your book, so that's yes. next. Thank you so much yes. for being here today. I appreciate you being here. Love and adore you, and thank you so much for watching today, guys. We'll see you every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. The Power Voices TLC Unleashed. Bye, guys. Yay! Bye, guys.